what's up YouTube, Aureus here, and welcome to the Boomer's Guide to Final Fantasy XIV. Though all of my content on this channel has been geared towards Fortnite in the past, it seems a recent surge of interest between friends and family has cast one of my all-time favorite games into the limelight. I thought it best to start you folks with 10 broad topics that'll help you as a new arrival to this MMO powerhouse. The game itself is massive and loaded with hundreds of hours of content just at its spine, with virtually limitless stores of extra fun sprinkled all throughout. As with most Final Fantasy games, you've just gotta know where to look. Which is to say, everywhere. But before we hop into the first section, there's one very important thing to do. Personally, when I start any Final Fantasy game, I start with the big cinematics. But the content you're about to start with began some 10 years ago. I'd recommend clicking over to the Realm Reborn cinematic, pausing any other music you got going on, and cranking your headphones to max. This lets the Square Enix team do what they do best and throw you headfirst into the world you're about to roam. But when you're ready, let's get directly into character creation. If you're planning to track down the rest of us, make sure you're on the Crystal data center. You can choose any race and gender combination to your liking, the character customization options are vast, so take your time. The different character sub-races won't affect your gameplay or anything like that, and there are some things that can be adjusted in the game later. When it comes to your starting class, you can take time to read through the details, but don't worry too much about making the wrong choice. Unlike most MMOs, you're not locked down to a single class on a character in Final Fantasy. After you complete your level 10 class quest, you'll be able to pick up any class that suits your fancy. Though there are only 8 to choose from here, the greater game has over 30, and many of these require you to be a certain level first, or to complete certain parts of the main story quest. The biggest difference with your class choice is going to be how you want to play the game. Group content is based around the three class types, that's tank, healer, and damage dealer. Your usual dungeon group will have one tank, one healer, and two damage dealers. As a tank, you'll be expected to keep the attention of enemies and prevent them from hurting your party. As a healer, your job will be primarily to keep the party alive while dealing damage where you can. DPS classes look to maximize their damage output while avoiding unnecessary damage. Keep these in mind when choosing your starting class. The only other thing that's affected from this choice is which of the three city-states you start in. As you start your adventure, you'll likely notice a thousand quest markers that might pick your fancy, but don't get too distracted just yet. Instead, look for your main scenario quest, or MSQ, by clicking on the indicator here. These quests will have a meteor emblem around them, and should be completed before anything else. So much of the game is locked behind this quest series. You'll get plenty of experience, equipment, and gill from this questline alone. Your second priority for quests should be your class quests, shown underneath your MSQ here. These typically unlock every 5 levels, and sometimes unlock new abilities for your current class. Additional quest objectives might appear here too, including those for your chocobo after level 20. The third priority should be quests with this plus sign indicator. These often unlock additional features, dungeons, or harder difficulty content. You don't necessarily need to pick up every single one. Reading the quest title ahead of time often gives some clue as to what those quests might entail or unlock. You can save these for later if you see fit, but there's some important ones that we'll cover in a later video. You can ignore most of the side quests you see, as you might want to complete these later when you're leveling other classes. Getting around in Eorzea is surprisingly simple, though at first you might not like how much walking you're having to do, once you've unlocked the Aetherites and the Chocobo Porters across the regions, you'll find it simple. Large Aetherites can be found in most major towns, while in smaller Aetherites allow you to travel between points in the major cities. I heartily recommend attuning yourself to every Aetherite you come into contact with, especially in cities. Once you've attuned yourself to all the smaller Aetherites in any city, you'll be able to instantly teleport to any of the gates, which can really shorten some of your travel time. You can teleport to the large Aetherites you've attuned to using your gill from the teleport menu. You shouldn't find yourself wanting for too much gill using this system, so don't worry too much about the cost. Chocobo Porters become available to you after level 10, and after speaking with each Porter once, you'll be able to purchase a Chocobo that will take you between each of the nearby Porters. This can be very useful for covering distances when you're first getting started, especially for smaller towns that don't have their own Aetherite. Right around level 20 on your MSQ, you'll be able to choose one of the three city-states to pledge your allegiance to, and soon after be given the ability to get your very own Chocobo. This cuts down travel immensely, and after a few of the level 50 main scenario quests, your chocobo will even learn to fly in these areas. 
As you're adventuring, there are a few activities worth noting straight away. The first is the hunting log. This becomes available after your first class quest. The objective is simple, kill a few monsters, get some free experience points. The log will tell you the general area you might find your prey, and you'll find an indicator over any monster in the field that you need to dispatch in order to finish your log. Some of them aren't so easy to find, and if you find yourself giving up, don't forget about Google. Completing your hunting log will get you a nice level 50 ring, but the experience gained is honestly of far greater value. Fates are active time events that happen across the open world. You'll find them across the map marked by these purple emblems. Fates include a variety of tasks to complete for additional experience and other rewards. Common fates require slaying various waves of monsters, conquering mini-bosses, even escorting NPCs or collecting items. Feel free to take a break from your scheduled pro gaming and hop into a fate, just so long as you're at least the required level. You can sink your level down to participate in lower level fates, though of course you won't get quite as much experience. The Duty Finder is a feature you'll unlock around level 15. This allows you to queue into group content with random players from across your data center. This includes full dungeons, smaller guild hest challenges, and trials, powerful single boss encounters. Most of these become available through the MSQ and Plus quests, so don't worry about them too much if your duty list seems woefully empty. Using the Duty Finder is one of the fastest ways to level alternate classes, so keep these menus in mind. Next we'll get into equipment. Now it's easy to be daunted by the Final Fantasy XIV equipment system at first glance, especially if you're new to MMOs, but in truth, it's a cakewalk, and actually gets simpler as you proceed through the game. All of your equipment is stored in a subsection of your inventory called the Armory Chest. As for what to take and what to keep, for now, let's just break it down this way. Tanks look to keep tenacity and strength gear. Healers will look for intelligence and piety gear. Melee DPS prioritizes strength, where archer classes would prioritize dexterity. And mages, of course, would look for gear with plenty of intelligence. There's some nuance to it later, but that's really all you should need to know. Luckily, you won't have to make too many choices regarding what gear you need to be wearing either, as Final Fantasy has a lovely recommended gear button here on the main character page. Use this often, whenever you get a new gear piece, whenever you level up, whenever you complete a dungeon, and even for no reason at all. There's no harm in it. You'll soon be able to register your gear sets for all of your different classes and access them through this menu. Use this to easily switch between classes at your leisure, or go further and assign them to your hotbar to quick swap. You can do this almost any time you're out of combat, unless you're in an instance or duty. Don't worry about buying gear from the market board or from other players at this point. All of your gear into level 50 can be obtained from your primary quests, your dungeons along the way, and from the NPC vendors in each city-state. But only purchase them if you absolutely need to. Picking up a new class, for example, might require some basic gear from an NPC. Your equipment will wear out over time, causing it to eventually become useless until it's repaired. Repairing is important and should be done as often as possible. You can find repair NPCs in almost every settlement, marked by this hammer icon. Repairing is relatively cheap and certainly should not be overlooked for cost alone. Inventory management can also be a pain, initially, as there are so many different types of items and not too much instruction on what to keep and what to get rid of. As a general rule, at least until level 50, I'd advise getting rid of anything you don't have an immediate use for. When you're finished climbing through the game, you'll have the ability to pretty easily get the things you require if you're going to take on a new class or some other piece of side content. There are exceptions, things like dye, geisel greens, potions, food, and tombstones. These are things that might be worth keeping regardless. By the close of your level 20 MSQ, you'll have gained access to both retainers and to your chocobo saddlebag. This gives you tons of extra storage space if you really aren't certain you want to get rid of something, but you don't want it cluttering up your immediate inventory. Retainers will also allow you to sell certain items on the market. If you truly think an item is worth something to the public, and it doesn't have a market prohibited sign in its description, don't hesitate to ask your retainers to check the market board and see if you can make some quick gill. The combat system in Final Fantasy XIV is quite interesting, and though it takes some initial getting used to, overall it's a smooth and elegant beast. 
The first bit of advice I'd offer is to read your class abilities carefully. Some might seem complicated at first glance, but immediately start using them when you obtain them, and don't be afraid to ask the internet for assistance. Check each of the tabs in the Actions and Traits menu to see not only what you have access to, but what's coming up in the near future. The combat system is the lens through which you experience the rest of the game, so becoming comfortable with it really maximizes your overall potential. My second piece of advice regards enemy AoEs, or Area of Effect attacks, specifically those marked by this large orange shape on the ground. We call this a telegraph. You want to dodge these areas completely, whether you're playing solo or in group content, as they represent large amounts of incoming damage, sometimes worse. But also know that the marked area is only dangerous while the mark is active. The actual attack animation won't harm you if you weren't in the initial telegraph. This means you can dance out of the zone and right back in when it disappears to maximize your uptime, especially if you're a melee or casting class. Be sure to study your class. Melee classes, in example, need to remain close to their targets to deal damage. Archers and dancers can move around at most ranges and deal full damage. And spellcasters often need to remain completely still to maximize their damage potential. Keep these tips in mind and practice as you fight your way through the MSQ. Next we get into the settings and the UI. Final Fantasy XIV was the first MMO I encountered that had sublime controller support, which means that if you prefer to take a break from the usual mouse and keyboard gameplay, rest assured controller is not only viable, but incredibly comfortable. As with most MMOs, there are more settings than could ever be imagined, just a few quick clicks away. Take your time going over these yourself, as this can really tailor the game to your liking. Setting up basic keybinds can really help too, including things like targeting the nearest enemy or auto run. One important setting might be to turn off the names of other player characters that aren't in your party or on your friends list. Sometimes these can clutter up the area, as uh, seen here. Now the UI is completely customizable. You can change the size and shape of every single element, including the NPC dialog boxes. For you mouse and keyboard players, this also includes adding additional hotbars. Don't be afraid to move some of this around to your liking. You can even upload these settings to the Square Enix servers in the event you change computers or locations. When in doubt, the internet is your friend, as can be the myriad of folks you'll run into during your adventures. Don't be afraid to ask questions. Though the cutscenes may seem lengthy compared to many other games in the MMO genre, the story of Final Fantasy XIV is, in my opinion, some of the finest writing I've ever had the honor of playing through. The game gets better and better as you play, not only in the gameplay aspects but in the story elements, especially once you've cleared the Heaven's Ward and beyond around level 51. One of my favorite things about the game is that it assumes a certain intelligence from its players. It isn't afraid to play on our most basic human sensibilities, as only Square Enix could deliver. My advice? Take your time. There's a lot of content here, a lot of detail, and all of these small moments that lead to many greater and more terrible things down the line. Just maybe turn your BGM off in the settings, as prolonged exposure to the music may cause drowsiness in the early game, as is custom for the beautiful compositions of Nobuo Uematsu. If you feel yourself checking out of the early game story and you just want to get to the good part, so to speak, you can always return to your in-room later and read through the hero's journey to replay any cutscenes you might have skipped. It's okay to rush sometimes, I guess. Should you find yourself wanting to explore a different class, you'll be able to do so as soon as you've completed your level 10 starting class quest. As I mentioned earlier, many of these are locked behind the story or behind certain level requirements, but tend to start at higher levels accordingly. These include classes like Samurai, Red Mage, Dancer, or Gunbreaker, to name a few of the big ones. Crafting and gathering classes are a huge subdivision of the game and have their own progression and economy. There are a lot of fine resources out there to get you started, but if you'd prefer to explore on your own, you'll find the various corresponding guilds for these professions scattered across Eorzea's city-states. The Fisherman's Guild in Limsa Lominsa might be a good place to start. As with any Final Fantasy game in memory, there are seemingly infinite mini-games and additional content spread throughout the game. You'll find yourself falling into a lot of this, from ocean fishing expeditions to hundreds of hours lost at the Gold Saucer. 
Final Fantasy XIV even has a deep dungeon system that behaves as a roguelite, starting you off with a class at level 1 and allowing you to level it quickly in an instanced environment. There's a whole lot more, so keep an eye out for plus quests throughout the game and event information in the Final Fantasy XIV launcher so you don't miss out on the latest releases. Well that about covers it. 10 big, broad, very basic topics to get you started in Final Fantasy XIV. In time, it's my hope you'll fall in love with the game as much as I have. And I hope at least some of the analysis here was informative, but let me know down in the comments below if you'd like me to cover anything in detail as the future unfolds. With Endwalker releasing in just a couple of weeks, there's likely to be a whole host of different content to cover. Big shout out to our friends here in the valley, and I hope all of you are safe and warm out there. Stay safe and take care. See you next time.